ideas for programs, we'd love to hear from you. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Don at 74N4HH on his program on QSL. Well, thank you very much. I'm reminded of a scene from Casablanca. Louis and uh, Rick are sitting and, and they're engaging in a little conversation and Louis says to Rick, well, what, what was it that brought you to Casablanca? Rick says, I came for my health. Louis says, you came for your health? He said, yeah, I came for the waters. And Louis looks at him and says, waters? What waters? We're in the middle of a desert. And I love this line, Rick says, I was misinformed. <laughs> now there's a point to that story. Uh, when you're ready, Steve, it'll take a minute to probably to get that rolling. Um, if you came here expecting to hear me say something about QSLing, you were seriously misinformed. <laughs> uh, or I was misinformed, I'm not sure, because the instruction I got was to come and do a program that I had done previously for the Southeastern DX Club. And uh, so if you have not checked all your hard, inanimate objects at the door or other things, please do that at this point. Um, how are we doing, Steve? Getting close? All right, you can probably hit it. I don't think it has to load the whole way. Uh, so this evening I'm going to... Uh, Here's the issue. I've got to get it to come up in this monitor now because we're using your viewer. So give me a moment. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, about yourself, Don. How long have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't dance. Uh, some of you saw a program that I did uh, quite some time ago, which was, you know, <laughs> thank you. I, that I appreciate. Uh, that had to, I did a little bit about my history. I've been in amateur radio since the uh, early 50s. <laughs> And over that period of time, I, like you, I've had some periods of inactivity and uh, uh, managed to work through those things. Almost immediately, what, uh, what caught me in ham radio was uh, DXing. And so for the most part, that's been my life, is uh, DXing in the world of, of uh, radio. <coughs> There's just something mysterious, even though I was an engineer and knew a little bit of the theory behind it, something mysterious about sitting here and doing something that affects someone somewhere else through the ether. It's pretty amazing. Go ahead, Steve. Um, so uh, this evening, uh, we're going to look at a couple of things. Uh, first of all, is a little de-expedition I was on uh, to Lord Howe uh, a year ago or more. And Lord Howe, in case you don't know, it, it's, it's really interesting about some of these places you go to because, you know, you think oh, they're really exotic and you have no idea where they are and it sounds, you know, like you're in the deepest, darkest Africa or someplace. Here's Lord Howe, I'm sorry, <coughs> in your way, uh, which is off the coast of uh, New Zealand, pretty much off Port Macquarie. And it's about, uh, what would it be, 350 miles or so off the coast. You can see it's... It's a little bit further to Norfolk, and uh, you get down here in Macquarie and Heard. And actually, when you're in this part of the world, uh, other than the fact that it gets really cold down here, uh, it's pretty easy to get around to Christmas and some of the other places. It's a very uh, scenic island, as you can see, just absolutely uh, uh, something you'd see on uh, that old program where the plane came in, I guess, uh, de plane, de plane. Uh, this is the runway. And uh, ships can enter the sort of harbor through here, and there's another passageway here. Go ahead, Steve. It's not as serene as it seems. I found this clipping. Uh, this poor family was left stranded, if you will, on Lord Howe because someone, two men, stole their yacht. And uh, there was quite a hullabaloo. Now, you can't imagine how long ago this was. This was a 50-foot yacht and uh, it was uh, only worth 1,500 or 15,000 pounds. So, you know, this was a long time ago. Next, please. Now, how do you get to Lord Howe? This is the fun part. I was very fortunate. I have a friend who'd been a flight attendant for many, many years, and uh, she gave me a buddy pass, 
And uh, these are the joys, those of you that are frequent flyers and you get to fly business class elite and so forth, I pretty much hate you most of the time, except for this time on business class. The, har the, the hardest thing for me to do on that buddy pass was to get from Atlanta to LAX. It took me three days to do that, of going down to Hartsfield back and forth. Once I got there, however, ha, I scored business class elite, Sydney, uh, excuse me, from uh, LAX to Sydney. Next, please. And this is uh, some of the paraphernalia I took. I travel light. I always go with my Altoids. And here I have dentine. And these are my great, uh, as we'll find out later, you'll hear a lot about knockers. Next, please. This is uh, coming into Sydney. Next. And uh, the fly guys will appreciate seeing the... Uh, in your way, aren't I, Wes? I'm sorry. You'll appreciate seeing what the uh, runways look like uh, coming into uh, Sydney. Next, please. It's an absolute wonderful place uh, to visit. And I, actually, it would be a wonderful place to live in Sydney, but they really don't want you there. <laughs> they want you to come spend a little money and go away. Uh, but you, you come off the plane, you go into the duty-free shop. Now, I want you to notice, go ahead, one more and one more. Notice all of these things deal with alcoholic beverages. And uh, really, you could spend two or three days in here and never even know you were in that part of the world. Uh, it's amazing. And of course, the requisite shot, I took this from up on the, uh, the Harbor Bridge. You recognize the, uh, the Opera House and so forth. Next, please. And if you can see these little blue things right here, and these are steps going up the Harbor Bridge. There's a tour where you can uh, hike the Harbor Bridge and crazy people, not me, but crazy people like to hike up there and stand up there and look down and I'm getting dizzy just looking. Uh, this is part of what you see in Sydney. This is the circular key. Lots of ferries run out into the harbor and they connect a lot of the little uh, places around Sydney. Absolutely wonderful place. This is at a uh, pub. Sydney is very English, as you might expect. This is a Dorcaster, and you'll recognize this old man here, who's a lot older now, he, sing, he thinks. Uh, this is uh, my good friend Saul, uh, K2XA, uh, and this is my other good friend Les, W2LK. Uh, uh, and you may have, those of you who are DXers and are following a little bit of what's going on with uh, the Campbell Island operation, you may have read some things that uh, Les put in there. Both of these guys, that's good, you just stay there. Both of those guys are exceptionally good CW operators. I signed on to be the only CW operator. Thank the Lord these guys signed on to. Uh, you know, the requisite, uh, you know, sharing of uh, good times. Next. And uh, here you can see how incredibly difficult it is to get to this rare spot. Uh, you'd jump on a Qantas, here it is right here, a 2260, leaves out of gate 58 at 1150, a couple of hours later, uh, you're, uh, you're at uh, Lord Howe. Uh, one of, just one of the shots of us in the airport. This is Eddie, uh, this is Alex, I'll tell you more about Alex, this old man you're listening to now, Johnny, some of you following Campbell Island have, have uh, encountered Johnny. This is me friend Brucey, me mate. And this is Rafi, who uh, turned out to be a, 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 just a wonderful friend. Next, please. And that's uh, myself and Rafi. We had just met. The guy is absolutely crazy. Uh, he owns something like 27 properties around Bondi Beach. If you've been to the, uh, if, you, if, you've, if you've been to, to the Sydney area and you know anything about surfing, you know about Bondi Beach. And a guy who owns 27 properties, <clears throat> next. <laughs> Uh, this is Alex. Uh, he's from Denmark. They were very serious about weighing, weighing the bags here, and he's sort of like uh, boosting his a bit. <laughs> this is, uh, you fly guys probably recognize this. This is a, uh, what they call this, a um, Dash 8, a Dash 8, a de Havilland uh, turboprop, and this is what we flew out to uh, Lord Howe on. This is some of our luggage being, being uh, loaded. Go ahead. Uh, and uh, to Lord Howe, you notice we're boring. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how, how that worked out. Next, please. 
uh, Qantas is very good, by the way. I, I do like flying Qantas. And, and, and regardless of the hour of the day, they will fill you up with as much wine as you can possibly drink so that your flight is uh, more palatable. Yes, memorable. It could be memorable. And there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, nibbles and so forth. Go ahead. Uh, first view, sort of Lord Howe. Keep going. And uh, this is a little movie. You fly guys will appreciate this. This is what it's like to fly into Lord Howe. which is about 1,000 feet usable. SABA is probably the shortest actually involved in commercial uh, flight in the world. Or paved, let's put it that way, because it is, SABA is paved. So this runway is about three times the usable, uh, usable space, usable uh, distance. And uh, you How may have to video. Yeah. Pardon me? How did you get, get up video? in the front to get that yeah. video? Uh, that was the uh, <coughs> officer that was sitting in the right seat. Yeah. With um, a little probing, oh, probing, okay. Okay. <laughs> provocation. Brian, uh, Brian here's Brian. the old man at Lord Howe. It's a world heritage uh, area, which means only so many people are allowed on the island at one time. <laughs> now, this is what we. Uh, this is how we set up. Uh, this is obviously the runway that you came in on, and here you can see north. We had two operating sites, one called Ocean View, which you really couldn't see the ocean from Ocean View, but it was close. And the other one was Broken Banyan, go ahead. And uh, this will give you a little better idea uh, of, um, uh, of where these two things were situated. Uh, this is, um, oh, that's all right, that's fine. This is Mount, <laughs> that was Mount Grower in the background, but all right, we'll take a quick look at uh, Ocean View, go ahead. Uh, we were there in, in what would be their winter. There really was not much of anyone on the island. Uh, it was summer here, and of course it was winter down under. Go ahead, Steve. And uh, you can see that Ocean View is a little bit of a resort area. It's not exactly like roughing it on uh, Mount Palo or, or anywhere else. Keep going. Uh, you can see this is a community room. They had uh, washing, machi washing machines and dryers. And hey, a stand-up shower, wouldn't you love to have that from time to time? We had these two rooms at Ocean View beside one another, go ahead. And uh, sleeping accommodations were, uh, uh, were obviously uh, quite good. Broken Banyan was the other location, go ahead. And uh, amazing Banyan trees, just incredible Banyan trees, go ahead. This is an interesting, we'll stop here for a moment. It was cold. Um, temperature was, oh, 38 to 42. And being on an island, the humidity was high. And I mean, it was just bone crushing cold for those of us who had come from summer 
basically. For the, the Aussies that were there, uh, you know, it was winter for them, and that wasn't much of a winter. But eventually, we did get the proprietor, we were the only ones, by the way, at Broken Banyan, to break out what is known as an electric sheet. Now, I've slept under an electric blanket, but uh, I was told by this very proper English woman who ran uh, Broken Banyan that this was an electric sheet and it had to be placed on the bed exactly in a certain way. And you can see I goofed up here. It wasn't quite over far enough. But I got to tell you, this was an absolute savior of, a, uh, of, a, of an operation. This little guy, I've never seen this in the States. I, I guess we have things like this. This just heated hot water, and it did it almost at the snap of the fingers. And, and we use this all the time. Go ahead. Now, this is interesting. The, at uh, Ocean View, you saw the washer and dryer. The accommodations at Broken Banyan weren't quite that luxurious. I must confess, I'd never seen one of these before. This is actually a washing machine. And what you do is, uh, there's a hose here. You put some soap down in here, you throw some clothes down in there, you put some water in it, and then this thing just sort of shakes everything for a while. <laughs> when you get to the quote-unquote rinse cycle, you take a bucket of water while this thing's shaking and it pours it through the clothes. That's rinsing. You take your uh, soggy, <laughs> soap-laden stuff out of here, you put the, pull this little uh, side up, and there's a centrifuge in there. You stick your stuff down in there and it centrifuges the, the stew out of it. And the result is, next please, that you hang your stuff on the line. Uh, so you get, a, uh, you get a fresh, clean smell because you're, you're doing your laundry outside. This is Rafi. Rafi and I ended up moving, uh, living together. Rafi was our, uh, our cook, and uh, this is uh, in our uh, little uh, area, and there's actually a, uh, a station set up right over here, and there was a bedroom sort of over there. I got to tell you, if you go on one of these things, you don't want to stay in the kitchen area. Not a good thing. People there all the time. Uh, go ahead. Here are some of the antennas. We shipped a lot of this stuff ahead of time. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, there is, this is uh, six meters. Uh, this is a uh, 12 meter Moxon. Uh, go ahead. Uh, here we're putting up a... Uh, uh, 40 meter vertical. Go ahead. Um, geez, I don't even remember what that was. Oh, that's three elements on 15. Go ahead. This is me mate. Uh, this is uh, Brucey, who uh, I nicknamed the Hammer. And if you look, you can see those of you who are bikers or no bikers, Brucey's got his sleeves here. And uh, down under, they don't call these guys bikers, they're bike ease. Bike ease. So the hammer uh, got to be my best mate. This is Alex diddling with that 40 meter uh, vertical. Go ahead. Uh, some of the stuff uh, strung around. There's the 40 meter vertical. Uh, you can see some lines coming down here from another one. Go ahead, Steve. This is a uh, step IR. Jimmy, you'll like this. Uh, step IR, big step IR with the 80 meter coil. This was at Broken Banyan. And we had eventually put 100 radials out under this thing. Now, I need to tell you, it, don't take it personally, Jimmy, it didn't work worth a toot. <laughs> Did not work worth a toot. That 40 meter vertical that we put up with only three um, radials worked great, but they were three above ground radials. We moved this bad boy down to ocean view and it was an absolute rat killer. It was an amazing antenna. Go ahead. Uh, some of the antennas that uh, at the Broken Banyan. Here's a, this is interesting if you know anything about moxons, you know that they, this element doesn't come all the way together. And you can see there's a little bit of fishing line. You can't see the fishing line, but that's the break. This is actually a solar water heater. Go ahead. Uh, another view of the moxon. And hit down here somewhere you can see that little, oh, there it is right there, uh, where the element, go ahead. Uh, putting up a, a, a three element uh, 20, this fence back here is electrified, and uh, yes, we had at least one person contacted, much to their surprise and our delight. Go ahead. Uh, three elements on 20. Go ahead. 
uh, what is this? This is uh, six meters and uh, 12 meter Moxon. And, and uh, let's see. I guess that's the same thing. I can really see from this angle. Go ahead. Uh, we had a, an advanced uh, way of uh, cabling and making sure that we identified everything. As you can see, go ahead. There's a uh, f three elements on 15 at the top of this pole. We pretty much took over uh, these places. That's another one of those solar water heaters. Go ahead. Uh, this was this was just amazing. Um, this is Tommy, and uh, he was our he was our uh, leader, and all of this evolved around probably for 45 minutes putting together a three element 10 meter Yagi which if you've been playing radio as long as I have been you know what the dimensions are already well then we got into trying to convert centimeters and millimeters to inches and feet and and finally somebody walked over and said hey just go away we'll put the antenna together and, and it worked great good uh, that is the uh, that's the 10 meter antenna right there go ahead Keep going. Okay, this is important if you're on a de-expedition or, you know, if you're trying to work a de-expedition, you know, if you have a directional antenna, where do you point the thing? So this was uh, the great circle in terms of where is everybody, and you can see from where we were that the U.S. was pretty much like Europe is from here. So uh, this was important to us in, in, because we didn't bring rotors, we just armstrong the antennas around. And uh, so we'd point to uh, North America, we'd point to Europe or Asia or South America. Go ahead. Uh, this is a quick little video. You're going to listen kind of closely to this one. Try not to look at it, it'll make you sick. It's a rotor. in um, Europe uh, sent us that. Go ahead to the next one. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Back, can you back up one? Uh, do this one. This is, uh, you'll recognize, well, you may not because the tuning was a little off frequency. This is on 20. that little clip for a couple of reasons obviously but but one is that you could tell this was also received by uh, one of our Italian uh, friends who sent it to us that um, we were working uh, everything Europe to the USA 20 meters was pretty much open in every direction uh, in spite of the fact that we might have had the uh, the beam on um, on Europe we were still working USA and so forth next please there's the old man uh, working the uh, Way uh, Walker will recognize this. That's Way's travel Bagali. Bagali, thank you very much. We all used it. This is a little SPE uh, one kilowatt amplifier that ones are uh, made in Italy, and I got to tell you, they work extremely well. Uh, I don't know what I was on there. Probably 40 CW or something. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, hit this one. This created a little problem for us. Well, you might recognize this lad right here. Tone one. 
Let's see what he's doing. He gets too much glare on the, Just on the screen. Just start with 150 megas. Uh, okay, is this autofocus, I guess? It should autofocus a little bit. Uh, what you're looking at is uh, RTTY DM780 on 15 meters. Via USB to the 590. USB to the 590. Got a little bit of soup on the end of it. Tommy's in the chair. Everyone else is sitting around with their thumbs in unmentionable places. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, that just made you sick, didn't it? Watch that quick pan. We're going to slowly pan over here. Oh, look at this mate. Matey. What do you got there, Bruce? I've got a couple of uh, man pass filters, 40 and 30 meters. All right. Oh, man. Excellent. Excellent. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. All right. All right. Good show. We're going to fade away now, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason I said what I said was that we devoted time to working RTTY, uh, and the Aussies love RTTY, by the way, and of course it was their show, so really much to do about it. But then if you're following the Campbell Island uh, group, of which Tommy was the leader, by the way, for Campbell Island as well, uh, they had, had a sort of a little mutiny about spending so much time with RTTY when there were stations that that uh, needed it for an all-time new one to uh, service other modes. Uh, go ahead. Uh, go one more. Uh, that was uh, just on 15 meters. Here's the old man. Uh, this, by the way, you'll see this again. This is the 2.5 kW SPE amplifier. We had, I think, number two, the second one that, uh, uh, that they had put out. This thing will actually put out 2.5 kW DC output. It's a solid state amplifier. Of course, I need to tell you that the power limit is only 400 watts. Um, next, please. <laughs> uh, we spent uh, as much time as we could to try to work uh, 160. Remember here it was summer, there it was winter. Uh, we did get a, a fair number of people in the 160 log. Uh, we'd always work the gray line until it just petered out on 160. And, and that was a given. We had put our feet down, so to speak, and insisted that uh, 160 be given absolutely as much time as possible. This is a little Kenwood 590. Um, I gotta tell you, the radio's worked extremely well. The 5 590 is a pretty doggone good little radio. Go ahead. Uh, here's part of the log I think I was on. Uh, you won't see any of our guys here on, on uh, 160. W8GG and K8GG, you'd think that might be a mistake, but it's not. Uh, this guy, WD5COV, I heard, yes, I heard that station everywhere. Uh, it was pretty amazing. The only person on 160 that I recall that we worked in our area here was uh, Greg, uh, W6IZT. We worked him on 160, go ahead. Uh, this is another quick video, and uh, go back to the video for a second. Tommy, tsunami, big one. It's on. The red light is on. Okay. Here we are at the World Heritage List at Lord Howe Island. VK9 I uh, VK9 NID expedition. Feeding the sharks here. <laughs> Look at the size of these things. Alex has never seen fish like this in his whole Danish life. Look at them. Here comes Don Meningus. Don, get in here, man. Look at the size of that papa! Yeah, Look at this one! There's Donner's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> this may be knockers. I always thought knockers were in a different place. Oh, there's a big one right here. You see this bad boy? With the black tail? That one went for me pee pee. <laughs> You're all on. Oh, really? It went for me pee pee pee. Look at this big knocker. Whoa! Dad. This one was a black tail. Don, let me just send you a trick. Your toes in the sand. Really? Oh, <laughs> that looks like a These really are not sharks. I don't know what they were, but they didn't bite. Look at the one behind the pussy tank. 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 Look at the one behind the pussy tank
Okay. Those of you who are Seinfeld fans, remember George and Shrinkage? <laughs> yes, what? You got Shrinkage here, baby. All right, Steve, you can hit the arrow. Arrow. arrow, arrow. <laughs> um, it is a uh, World Heritage um, um, uh, area. And I don't know what those fish were, but I mean, there were just what seemed like hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, the water, by the way, was quite cold. Afterwards, this is what happens with your knockers. Uh, underwear, so to speak, gets hung out in the sunshine again. Uh, go ahead, just another view. This is Rafi. This little amplifier here is one that I don't think is type accepted. But uh, they use an awful lot of these down under. They put out uh, about 300 watts or so. And uh, actually, they're quite uh, reliable. Go ahead. Oh, this is amazing. Our, <laughs> our, our good friend Alex uh, from uh, Denmark brought this. <laughs> uh, he brought this uh, multi-functional uh, tap. And we all knew that at one point or another, someone was going to be electrocuted. <laughs> Just no question about it. None of us tested it, but Alex swears that, that, that all of these are dead except for the one you're plugged into. We didn't try. Go ahead. Uh, this is Eddie. That's the 160 position. That's that bigger SPE. Go ahead. Uh, Saul operating the, the little SPE. Uh, another one of the shots of the stations. Go ahead. And this is what our view looked like, a little different from many D expeditions that you see. Uh, go ahead. Keep going. Uh, pretty nice. Pretty nice. Larry, Curly, and Mo taking a break. I want you to I can back up just one. Um, yeah. This, uh, whoops, Alex. Uh, you see, Alex is drinking this adult beverage. I have never known anyone that would drink beer from sun up to sun up as Alex did. I, the guy was just incredible. I guess they have nothing else to do in Denmark. Go ahead. Uh, they don't have yield signs. You give way. And this, by the way, you could walk back and forth to the uh, different operating sites. Uh, keep going. There's the old man. Go ahead. This, uh, in, uh, in Danish, I asked Alex about this, and it means something like, Keep your grubby hands off my computer. But he was the only one that could pronounce the words. Uh, keep going, Eddie. And, and there, no way, back up to uh, Alex again. This, is, this guy is amazing. If you work just on high speed CW, my, my CW starts to fall off at about 35. Um, Alex is an absolute witness. At the same time he's drinking beer, he's running about 45 words a minute here. And you see this computer screen back here? We had enough Wi-Fi at this location that he was IMing his girlfriend while he was doing all of this. God. Just an amazing operator. There is a, a gas pump, um, and just like on Saba, well, Saba's actually got what? One, four pumps? Are there four? One, two, three, four? But they're only open a couple of hours, aren't they, Way? All right, well, we have one pump here on Lord Howe. It's open all the time. But it depends on whether or not there's gas available. But there is a pump. Go ahead. Uh, the war did not make it to Lord Howe. There were no skirmishes. Nothing happened in World War II there. But there is this uh, Maxim machine gun memorial. Hump, uh, Humpty Mix Cafe is right here. Uh, go ahead. This is a view of Humpty uh, Mix. Keep going. Australian meat pies. Oh, my God. They love their meat pies. They just live on them. Go ahead. Interesting to me was that uh, they don't put labels on in calories. They put them on in kilojoules. And I'm trying to remember, I, there may be something like uh, 10 kilojoules per calorie or something. Does anybody know? I, I knew it one time. Yeah, you got to convert it, but go ahead. And here's just a shot of the crew. Go ahead at, at Humpty's. Now, it's always fun to compare what you do with what others do. Go ahead. So I picked out, I picked out uh, something that might be familiar to some of us. And this, of course, is uh, Malpelo, uh, HK0NA. Uh, uh, and this is how the folks, that could be someone we know. I don't know. Do you recognize? <laughs> I don't know who that is. But at any rate, you can see this is going between uh, 
op site A, which I think was up here, and uh, B, which was down here. So this is how the Malpelo group got from site to site. Go ahead. Uh, and here they are. Keep going. And here we go. And you know, the, the people on the other end of the pileups, honestly, have no clue what goes on on the end that they're trying to work. Uh, go ahead and hit this one. This is a video just for a second. This is how we got from off-site to off-site. G'day, mate. Uh, you can easily see that uh, we either walked or took the car. Go ahead. Uh, this is their beach. Go ahead. This is our beach. You notice just a little difference. Go ahead. This is island wildlife that they encountered. This is island wildlife that we encountered. And, uh, and I mean no offense, but the next one, please. It's just illustrative. Um, this is wildlife. These are their baby chicks. These are our baby chicks. Go ahead. Uh, this is their breakfast. This is our breakfast. Amazing cappuccino, by the way. Go ahead. This is their swimming pool, and I think I'm right about this, that Those these are, are hammerheads. The biggest collection, actually, in the world. They all congregate there. That's their swimming pool. This is our swimming pool. Go ahead. This is them sleeping at Op A, I think. And this is our sleeping quarters. Go ahead. Uh, so you can see there's quite a difference. Now, the, the, the biggest part for us was that we did have to get weighed on the way back because the plane was full. Go ahead and uh, keep going. Uh, this is us just packing up, getting ready, getting on the, uh, the Dash 8. Go ahead. And leaving, uh, leaving uh, Lord Howe, going back into uh, Sydney. Keep going. And this is at the... the uh, the group kind of getting our stuff. Well, all right, go ahead. How did we do? Nobody got hurt. This is always important. Uh, go ahead, next. Uh, there were, I, I can't say there were, there were no issues. There were no major issues. There was a little pushing and shoving from time to time. You, you got to remember that, that more than half the crew were Greeks, and Greeks do a lot of flailing, a lot of uh, noise, etc. So things got a little, go ahead, got a little carried away time. Anyway, we did manage to make 15,000 cues. Go ahead. Uh, and here's sort of a breakdown. There were four of us operating CW. Eh, well, we, we made 1,100 cues left. The, the, this wasn't quite at the end, but um, I think we held up around. There were six of them operating the phone, four of us on CW. Go ahead. Uh, and you can see some of the leaders here. Go ahead. Okay, why didn't you make more cues? 15, you know, this cost a lot of money, by the way, out of our pockets. Why didn't we make more cues? 15,000 cues, I mean, you know, you make that in a contest sitting in your living room, for Pete's sake. Um, now, in spite of all of our cunning, go ahead, this was our competition. ST0R was on at the same time we were. They made 121,000 cues. And I can tell you one of the reasons we didn't make more on CW was we'd be, we always operated split on CW. I'm on CW operating, I'm hearing people call me, you know, KC up, KC and a half up. I'm going back to them, they're not coming back. I'm going back to them, they're not coming back. You know, three or four times going back and forth, they're not coming back. Then I discover why? Because ST0R is a KC below me <coughs> listening to KC's up. So these Ooh. people were actually calling the ST0 instead of us. Uh, this is what our, uh, our on-island team was. Go ahead. And this is the, the six Aussies, wonderful people. This is uh, John and Eddie and Rafi and um, Peter. And I'll come back to Tommy in a minute. And Brucey, and this is Tommy who was the leader. Go ahead. And this is our upside team, myself and Alex and Saul and uh, Les. Go ahead. Now, I did a little after party. <laughs> I, uh, I went to gate 54. I went back to Sydney, I hung out for a little while and decided, you know, I'm in this part of the world, why not hang around? So I spent a couple of months. Um, I, I, this, this sloop at the rear of hoarding. I don't know what they were hoarding, but I went to the rear of hoarding, go ahead, and I ended up on the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> 
go ahead. And, and also did a little tour of some of the Fiji Islands and went, go ahead, and went over to uh, Vanuatu. Keep going. Uh, and then I decided it was time to come home. Now, for those of you, I heard someone say at the beginning of the meeting, uh, I'm 100 watts to a wire guy. This is for you. Because now I'm 100 watts to a wire guy again. Here's my, these are my rules, and this one in particular. Even if they're ESP, call them. I don't know how many of the 300 plus countries I've worked that I just sensed I was working them. <laughs> call them, go ahead. Uh, this is then, that's me, the idiot, standing up there on the boom of one of my 20 meter antennas. Uh, six elements on, uh, no, yeah, six elements on 10 meters. That young buck, and that's a very happy guy. Go ahead. This is what I'm doing now, using a little K3, got a P3, keep going. This is my antenna. If you ever see me spot someone, I put it on, I say, you know, 599 on my indoor wire. <laughs> well, this is my indoor wire in my apartment. Um, it just goes around this steel cased door. Go ahead. And there's, I got a little ballon here, speaker wire here, which is part of the loop, and there, and yes, it's right up against the transom. You have to maximize, if you're, uh, if you're a little pistol, go ahead, you've got to maximize. In the old days, some of you remember this, we listened for hours, we tuned and listened and tuned and listened, and we waited, <laughs> we waited for the DX sheet to come saying that somebody might be there maybe on this frequency, and maybe at this time. Today, use a cluster program. Somebody spots them, they put them out there, you know exactly who they are and where they are. I use VE7CC, there's plenty others to use. This is what VE7CC looks like. It's a, I love the program. Uh, you can click on uh, time and of course order by time. You can click on DX, puts them in alphabetical order. Click on frequency, gives you the last hour of spots so you're not wasting your time. You can look at announcements, you've got propagation here, uh, gives you a blow by blow, go ahead. Uh, you can set up alarms in it, and this is important to me. Seven Oscar Six Tango was very important to me. Remember, I have this indoor wire in 100 watts, go ahead. Uh, you should use a logging program that controls your rig. I use uh, N1MM for contesting. Most of you won't like that. I think, I know Neil is a big HRD guy. N1MM will not track your awards. You can't automatically upload the logbook of the world. You can't blah, blah, blah. It's strictly a contesting DX program. Go ahead. This is what it looks like when I have it running. I have my general log up here. This is my input. This is the, what's coming in on Telnet through VE7. Uh, this shows me who's where. I click on any one of them. I go right there, the rig goes right there, it's right on frequency, in the right mode, blah, blah, blah. And these, of course, are band maps, go ahead. Uh, my advice, even if you're a big gun, watch the gray line. The gray line is incredibly important. You work stuff on the gray line, you never hear any other time. Uh, use propagation predictions, keep going. I use W6EL. It's an old program, and I'm not sure the algorithms are still as good as they were, but uh, it's relatively easy to set up, and I'll show you, keep going. This is, I was chasing the 7 Oscar for a reason, so 7.0 is right in here, go ahead. Uh, you can set up uh, defaults, keep going. And this is the kind of thing that I look at. Now, this, this is with the kind of defaults that a normal station would have. You got 100 watts to a wire, and the wire's up at 60 feet, you're gonna look like this. You got a three element tri-bander up at, at 50 feet, which, you know, the big guys scoff at, you're gonna look like this or better. And what you see here is just in graphic form what the propagation for different times UTC might, might look like. It's not guaranteed, but it might look like. And so, for instance, if you look here, and I can't really see, that's 40 meters, I think, and it's got an A on it. That A means that that path is going to be open 75 to 100% of the time at this time. So if you're a 40 meter aficionado, don't bother, don't waste your time for Yemen at 10 or 1200 UTC. The path isn't gonna be there for the most part. Now anything can happen. I click again. 
This is what it looks like in my situation when I put my defaults in. Look at the difference. Go back, back one second. Look, look at how much higher, first of all, and how much longer. Go ahead. And now this is what I'm dealing with. And I can tell you, almost within 15 minutes, since I'm a little pistol again, when I work somebody, it's going to be within 15 minutes of when it's predicted. It's absolutely amazing. Go ahead. Keep going. And just another type of display. Go ahead. Okay, does it work? Go ahead. Uh, HK0NA, uh, you know, pretty much from here shooting ducks in a barrel. But did I work them? I worked the stew out of them. I even worked them on RTTY. And I don't even know anything about RTTY. Except I set up DM780 and it worked. <coughs> so, uh, so this was with my 100 watts to my indoor wire. Go ahead. Now this is what's really important. I'm at 357. I'm actually higher than that right now. I need three to get to the top of the honor roll. Yes, I'm on the honor roll, but the big deal is to get to be the big dog on top of the honor roll. I need three. One of them is Yemen. Go ahead. Did I work Yemen with my 100 watts to a wire? I sure as heck did. And I used the propagation. I used the spotting systems. I used the propagation forecast. And you can see where I worked them. So go ahead. Does it work? There's the proof in logbook of the world. Absolutely. Go ahead. Now, that means for you, the 100 watts to a wire person or less, or you QRP guys, there's no excuses. If I can do it, you can do it. Now, I want you to be on the lookout for uh, my good friend, Way Bob. We call him Way Bob because he's in the South. He's going on a very difficult de-expedition, uh, January 29 to February uh, 20 or February 6. This is their villa, uh, and uh, this is going to be the QSL card, I, I guess. So look for Way. I'm sure you'll work him. And thank you very much. so hard to get back to that slide but the gray line basically is is you know in the morning if you're a morning person it just begins to get light you know the sun is just beginning to come up and at that particular time you have layers that are switching back and forth and switching on and so it creates a path a propagation path that you don't usually get unless it's right on that that the cusp of that and by the way in um, in VE7CC, it'll indicate which uh, stations are on the gray line and put a little, puts a little sun beside them. So you, if you don't know where the gray line is, you don't have a map. You can look at that. So it's, um, it, it's kind of the low banders dream come true. Yes, sir. Uh, what bands are you able to work with your indoor antenna? <laughs> I've actually worked a few stations on 40 with it. Now that, that, that opening is about. 12 feet by seven and a half feet. So that's what the loop is sort of like. Um, I think I actually worked somebody once on 160, but it's really a function of the, uh, the ATU and that little K3. I swear it'll load up your finger if you, you, know, if you wanted to. But basically, my, my setup is 20 meters, uh, you know, 17 meters, 15, 10, 12. You know, that's where I'm going to work. I'm not going to, I do occasionally work somebody on 30, but. Lower in frequency, it's it's not good. Um, and why is it you're not using an amp since you own one? I am now. I wasn't then, but I am now. I have, on occasion, I have a, uh, a an Elecraft a KPA 500 that I got after this, and at one time I thought, okay, this loop ought to work on six meters, and so I tuned up and I put the amp on on six meters, and I heard someone, probably someone here. And um, <clears throat> apparently right at that time, there was a malfunction in the uh, fire alarm system in that apartment building and the one across the street from it and the one just down from it. Uh, I, yeah, oh yeah, oh, all the buildings were evacuated and of course I realized what had happened. I'm throwing stuff in closets, I put my hat on, I, uh, I went down the steps, 
I got in my car, and as I drove away, two ladder trucks were on their way. I'm just saying it was purely coincidental. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Don, this is our tradition here at Norfolk. We want to uh, present you with this uh, valuable certificate of appreciation for your presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.